Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I want to uh, welcome you to an uh, invited uh, lecture by Heim Sampolinski. Uh, Heim is a computational neuroscientist for all seasons. Uh, you've probably heard about the Brain Initiative. This was announced uh, from the White House on April 2nd, 2013. So it's been going for more than two years. Uh, uh, the, the NIH. Uh, wanted to set priorities for the next 10 years and, uh, for a $5 billion project. So, you know, these grand challenges come along once every two decades or so. Uh, the last one was uh, the Human Genome Project, which has completely transformed biology. And the, the Brain Initiative, uh, we think, will have a similar impact on systems neuroscience, understanding the very complex uh, patterns of activity in brains that give rise to complex behaviors. So I served on the NIH committee that wrote that report for priorities. You can't fund everybody for everything. In fact, NIH already is spending $5 billion a year on human disorders like schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, uh, autism spectrum disease. Th these are extremely complex and devastating illnesses. And just simply throwing pills at them and chemicals it hasn't really been very productive. There aren't really any new drugs that have been um, introduced, which have any uh, real curative power. They're basically Band-Aids. So the Brain Initiative is really uh, an attempt to bring engineers and physicists and uh, mathematicians into neuroscience, because we desperately need uh, the, the, those tools to be able to help us make better measurements, to be able to to be able to uh, uh, record for more neurons, uh, to be able to link them to behavior. And, uh, and what was, I was very pleased that in addition to all the, uh, the neuroscientific uh, areas, uh, the brain theory was uh, considered one of the most important areas. Uh, and that includes uh, statistics, uh, computation, modeling, and theory. And, and Heim has contributed to all four of those areas. Uh, interestingly, we also identified machine learning as being incredibly important for uh, being able to uh, analyze cell identity from genomic uh, sequences, uh, for uh, transcription factors, for uh, being able to do connectomics, and for being able to interpret, decode large pa patterns of activity in populations of neurons. Heim was one of the early uh, members of the group of physicists who uh, were attracted to uh, neuroscience in the early days of, of Hopfield networks. His background is in condensed matter theory. Uh, he was trained at Bar Ilan University uh, near Tel Aviv uh, and, and uh, was very, very, uh, had, had the tools, he had the chops. Now, not only that, but after uh, the, the he was here at NIPS uh, in the early 90s. Uh, his, one of his papers is uh, in our collection, our archive. And at dinner last night, we had a wonderful uh, discussion, discovered that quite a few of the speakers that we have uh, with us today were actually uh, present or had come to early NIPS meetings when they were in Denver. Uh, we, 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 so this is, in a sense, a second coming from, for Heim and, and several of the others, uh, including uh, Rob, uh, uh, who gave this wonderful talk this morning, Tip Sharani. Uh, Heim uh, has won the Schwartz Prize for computational uh, and theoretical neuroscience. Uh, he's, he's really one of the giants in the field, and uh, I don't know of anybody smarter than he is in our business. Heim. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, and to thank Terry for his kind introduction. Um, when the organizers asked me for a title for my talk, I, it was many months ago. Uh, then I said, well, it's too early. I, have to, I need more time to think about what I want to talk about here. 
Uh, then Terry wrote to me and said, no, don't worry. Uh, do like what I do when I have this problem. I just give the title the computational brain, and it always works. So uh, this is an alternate title, um, the computational brain. But that reminds me to uh, <coughs> tell you about a little bit about my perspective of NIPS. Actually, according to Google, my first contribution to NIPS uh, is 1993, a paper with Iris Ginsburg on correlation function for stochastic or large stochastic neural networks. Actually, it was a nice paper. Um, and I, since then, I had been a regular contributor uh, to, to this conference. However, uh, I and I think many in the computational neuroscience uh, community uh, felt over the years that um, this conference grew out of its NIPS roots and, and became IPS, um, uh, diverging somehow from the neural of NIPS. So I think this is an opportunity to encourage uh, this community to uh, forge back strong relations or stronger relations to computational neuroscience. So uh, let me go through some of the biological motivation of uh, the things that I'm going to discuss uh, with you here today. Uh, transformations of sensory representations. It's ubiquitous feature of, of sensory systems in the brain uh, that one representation one set of data is transformed uh, in the next stage into another representation. One of the early systems that have been studied is the cerebellum, where the inputs, uh, are the mossy fiber inputs, they project into the granule cell layer uh, and then back converge onto uh, a single Purkinje cell as a, as a computational unit. And perhaps the first computational neuroscience theory uh, pioneering work by David Ma and followed by Jim Albus uh, and others, uh, already uh, uh, how do I, ah, it is not, not now. Yeah, uh, you can see it on the right, drew maybe the first diagram, uh, abstract diagram of a neural network of a real biological structure, and they realized that uh, there is uh, enormous expansion from the mossy fiber layer, uh, about a thousand of them in, this, in one unit, expanding in by a factor of 100 or 200 uh, to 200,000 uh, granule cells, which converge back to a, an output unit, which is the Purkinje cell. Um, a similar, similar pattern you see in hippocampus, where entorhinal cortex uh, expand into uh, into a granule cell layer in hippocampus and then converge into the CA3. Uh, and then another system, the insect olfunction. And similarly, in the in mammalian olfunction, you see a, a projection of sensory, uh, sensory information into uh, cortex or cortical-like uh, structures and then converging to various uh, output units. So, um, this and, and different uh, systems uh, motivate several, several questions. First of all, uh, what is the, what is the uh, computational logic of expanding? So number of neurons in projection layer over the number of neurons in input layer is the expansion ratio, and typical uh, numbers is between 10 and 100. Uh, another feature is the sparseness or sparsity. I denote by F, which is the number of neurons that are active for any given relevant stimulus in a layer. So the fraction of neurons that are active uh, is between 0.1 and 0.01, the sparseness level uh, of the representation. And often, a dense sensory representation is projected into a sparse and expanded representation. And then other questions have to do with the statistical nature of the synaptic weights that uh, mediate this projection. Uh, in some brain areas, uh, the statistics appear to be random, motivating the question whether indeed random projections uh, are computationally reasonable ways uh, of, of uh, uh, transforming sensory information. <coughs> okay, so this is about one, one layer, one transformation. 
But in many sensory systems, we know that there are hierarchies. The visual hierarchy is a very famous one, the Van Essen diagram, but others, like the auditory pathway, are also consist, or consist of uh, several stages and information propagate from one stage to another. Computational neuroscience largely focused in the last 20 years uh, about understanding local circuits in many systems, including cortical circuits. And in a recent review paper, or an opinion paper uh, in current opinion neurobiology, you can read my, my uh, idea that time has come for computational neuroscience to devote more intellectual resources into understanding the computational principles underlying larger structures, like hierarchical sensory structures and, and, uh, and others. So uh, this is the motivation behind what I'm going to tell you today. So the outline of my talk is going to be, first of all, discussing sparseness and expansion from one layer to a, a next intermediate layer, then expanding the, the study to deep architectures, multi-layer uh, sensory systems. Um, then I'm going to talk about two uh, elements, additional elements. One is in addition to propagating of signals from bottom up, sensory signals across deep architectures, how one can integrate top-down or contextual inputs into it. And, fi and, and finally, I'll discuss a, a recent work uh, on perceptual manifolds uh, and uh, how it relates to all these questions. Now, what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today, both in terms of the themes and in terms of the techniques, theoretical and computational techniques, are not new. Our actually, roots are in the old 80s uh, uh, days of, uh, of computational neuroscience, uh, and the list is very long, the issues of sparseness and different representations. M most of them are in the context of learning and associative memory. Uh, what the, the angle that I'm going to give today is focusing on sensory processing rather than on the learning aspect or the memory aspect. Okay, so let me start with sparseness and expansion. This is work which has been already published, uh, so you can see the details. Uh, for yourself, uh, but let me give you the highlight uh, of, of the work. So we are discussing now a very simple system. There is an input layer, uh, called it stimulus or sensory layer, and with NS neurons, projecting into an expanded layer, which usually we call it cortical uh, layer. Uh, projection layer typically has more neurons, so it's expanded, and sparse representation. And then finally converging into, for uh, simplicity, one readout unit. So how do we analyze the computational logic or the principles underlying this transformation? Now, we have to make assumptions. And here is the hypothesis. First of all, the, the, the philosophy is that information is, of course, in general, is not created by transforming into another layer. And in expansion, it's also not lost, usually. So the, the question is, what is the, the computational advantage of reformatting the same data? And one hypothesis is that reformatting the same data is done in order to allow for easier readout uh, of information for downstream systems. So specifically, I'm going to assume that the problem at hand is that sensory perceptual objects are hard to discriminate or to process or to make decisions upon because of the enormous variability of the underlying physical features, which I'll call noise. So changes in representations allow for simple readout and combating this aspect or this variance or noise in, in order to be able to, uh, to decode or classify or recognize object of perception. And what by, I mean by simple readout, I'll take the working hypothesis will be a single layer network, a perceptron, linear plus threshold, which is a very plausible biologically, uh, and that will be the working model uh, to implement this hypothesis. And there is a long list of uh, uh, authors that elaborated on this hypothesis. Um, you can read some of it in the literature. So how, do we, how are we going to test this hypothesis? And we have to make assumptions. And in the, in the uh, uh, tradition of theoretical physics um, and its contribution to computational neuroscience, we need to abstract the problem. We need to co construct a minimal model, which is the minimal model which is simple, 
but interesting enough so that these features of propagating of signals can be studied by analytical and by numerical simulations in a systematic way. So here, is, here are the assumptions that I'm going to, uh, to make. I'm going to assume that in state space of the neuron, of the, of the neural state space, uh, objects are represented by Gaussian mixtures or by clusters. They have sent each, each object as a center and has a, has a cloud of points which are associated or to be associated with the same object. However, because of the variance in various features, they form these clouds. So this is the way the input is represented. The output is binary classification with random labeling of those clouds, of those clusters. So as you can see in the, uh, down, uh, down uh, in, in the bottom, uh, uh, in the bottom uh, diagram, we are going to assume that the output has to make a linear classification uh, of those, uh, of those, uh, of those uh, inputs. Okay, so already now there are many parameters. There are number of clusters, P, there are the size of the cluster as it shows in the, the diagram, delta S, the, the level of noise normalized between zero and one, the size of the stimulus layer, and S, the size of the projection layer, and C, and the sparseness and cortical layer, F. But nevertheless, these systems are large, can be hundreds and thousands or millions, and the characterization is only by several five to ten parameters. So that, that's good. But there is, a, there is a fundamental question, and this is how to actually design or choose or learn the various weights in this system. So the readout weights W is actually easy because we want to apply a linear readout. We use some supervised learning, perceptron, Hebian, pseudo inverse, support vector machine. You choose your favorite linear classifier learning algorithm for that. But how to choose the projection weights? What is a reasonable strategy to choose J, the projection weights, and J does not know about the particular classification that the system has to perform downstream? So it's more like unsupervised uh, uh, synaptic weights. So as I said before, the simple assumption is that this is simply random projections. So denoting the first layer by S, the second layer by C, you just choose random matrix between them, J, Gaussian for instance, you then each neuron in the projection layer and the cortical layer linearly sounds the activity of the, uh, of the first layer, then you enforce the sparseness by some threshold and you generate a nonlinear expansion into a sparse representation simply by random projections. Is this a good strategy or not? Now, it turns out that the, the, the study, the analysis of this system show that this is actually a bad strategy. And what you see here is the readout error as a function of the sparseness f of, this, of the cortical layer. And the different, different curves correspond to different levels of noise. So for zero noise, actually the error is zero. The expansion is strong enough to actually be able to implement those binary classifications with no error. That's fine. But as long as you inject noise into the sensory uh, layer, the error becomes poor. And know that it doesn't really improve by making the, the representation sparse enough. Actually, there is an optimal sparseness in this case. And what is the reason for that? And the bottom diagram shows the actual reason for that. If you look at the, the, the size of the cloud as in, in the projected layer, you find that actually it's, it's expanded by this transformation. So random projection actually amplifies noise. And you can see here in the y-axis the, the size of the clusters in the cortical layer versus the, the size of the clusters in the input layer. And you see that there is a, 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 a super threshold, so to speak, expansion of the noise or the side of the cluster. So that doesn't seem to be a good strategy. That shouldn't surprise us. Compressed sensing theory tells us that random projections in some sense may be a very good strategy to compress signals. But here we're not compressing signal, we're actually expanding it. Another interesting uh, theoretical result coming out of the analysis of this simple network is that Actually, there is a limit to how much you gain by expanding the projection layer. And you can see in, the, in this uh, graph that 
that the, 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 the reduction in error actually saturate and doesn't keep uh, improving as the size I increases. That's, that's a remarkable and surprising result. This is n had nothing to do with the issue of overfitting because there is not a learning problem, and I'm assuming we have all the data uh, that, that we need, but it's more in, an issue of representation. And actually, the reason underlying it is that by projecting signals from the low dimensional to the high dimensional, even with random projections, those signals become correlated. So I, do not by, I, I won't define it to you, denote the correlation by Q, I just say that in the input layer, I'm assuming that the, the, the centers are random, so this would be Q equal to zero uncorrelated, but as soon as you project them to the cortical layer, those signals are correlated and, uh, and uh, generate non-zero Q, which then can be shown to underlie the fact that even though you keep expand, even if you keep expanding the projection layer, you don't actually improve the performance of the system. So there are two important issues. One issue is the, the amplification of noise or the suppression of noise, and another issue is the generation of correlations. So what are the alternatives? The alternatives is to get rid of random idea of random projection and look for some, uh, some other alternative ideas. And I'm going to suggest a Hebian synapse as, as an alternative. Now, we usually think about Hebian synapse in the, in the context of recurrent networks, and then it's naturally the Hebian synapse are encoding patterns, attractors that have some cognitive, well-defined cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive interpretation. But here, it's different because those intermediate representations that don't have an obvious uh, a cognitive uh, uh, interpretation. So what, what we suggest here is that there are two states. There is the allocation state and association state. In the allocation state, we simply choose pure random sparse representations to represent or to be the core of the new representation of the sensory signals, and then we use Hebbian rules to associate between the original sensory uh, representations and, uh, and the newly chosen or allocated uh, sparse representations. So that's a very simple uh, rule, and the performance is enormously better. So you can he see here the error is, uh, is especially for highly sparse uh, uh, regime, the error is, is almost zero compared to uh, the random case, and you can again trace it to, uh, to the enormous suppression or exponential suppression of noise when the signal propagates from the, from the sensory uh, layer to the, uh, to the cortical layer uh, here at the bottom. And analysis shows that, that this uh, Hebbian suppression of noise in this uh, expanded uh, sparseness uh, is, uh, uh, works well in the regime, in the high sparse regime defined by F times the, the load on, on the input layer, the number of clusters divided by the number of neurons in the input layer. So as long as this, as this product, the product of these two terms, the load time sparseness is small enough, uh, then you have a very good uh, performance and suppression of noise uh, in, this, uh, in this process. Okay, so what, what if we are not in this regime? What if the size of the cortical layer is not so large that we cannot afford such a sparse representation, or the load is high? So here we go to deep architecture, it's a recent work with uh, uh, Bakhtash Babadi, Elia Franklin, and Jonathan Kadmon. The, the, the last two are students at the Hebrew University. And here the structure, the, the strategy is going to be the following. There are going to be two iterative processes. One iterative process is how we construct layers. As I'll show you, we just have iterative process going from one layer to building another layer. And then there is an iterative dynamics. One, we constructed the deep network, the propagation of the signals themselves define dynamics which can study by statistical mechanics or dynamical systems concepts. So first of all, can we resurrect the random weight hypothesis by going into deep networks? So very simply, assume that you have many stages of random weights followed by threshold nonlinearity and then sparsity. Well, the answer is no. Even if uh, original error happens to be going down for the first layer, it will eventually go up to chance level, and the noise will go up to the maximum level of one. And you can actually 
analyze why this is so by again using the iterative map uh, 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 tools from dynamical system by thinking about how the noise propagate from one layer to another in this large or long deep networks. And what happens is that there are two fixed points, one zero fixed point with a zero noise fixed point, one maximum noise, one, and it, it so happened that the zero fixed point is unstable all the way, so no matter where you start the system, eventually the system will go to a fixed point at the deep layers with, with a maximum spread of noise and complete destruction of the of this clustering in the, in, in the sensory input. So that's, that's a bad strategy. Okay, what about the structure and uh, Hebian, Hebian way? So what we do here is simply iterate the process. At each stage, we take the previous uh, representations of the clusters, we generate random candidates in the next layer and associate them by Hebian weights. And this works remarkably well. It works remarkably well even in the high load and not so sparse regime where the error, even when you go down to, uh, to the first layer, is, is really not impressive. It goes down from 0.3 to 0.2 but as you further propagate the system, the noise become actually quenched out uh, until you get actually zero error. And that has to be, you can be compared to an infinitely shallow or infinitely wide single layer. And as I said before, in this case, the error doesn't really go down to zero, even for infinitely wide uh, layers. So, so the actual sequence of of, uh, of uh, uh, non-linearities and associations with the Hebian associations is crucial for the success of the system. It's actually interesting to, uh, to explore the, the propagation of the signals. These are high dimensional signals. The networks are large, many layers, but you can actually understand what's going on by reducing this, the problem into the dynamics in two dimensional uh, phase space. One is the level of noise delta, in the x-axis, and the other one is the level of correlations that are at each stage or at each layer uh, q. And as you can see here, the signals, the initial values, are all initial conditions are all start with the y-axis be at zero because the inputs are always random centers, so they're uncorrelated. However, they, each line starts from a different level of noise. And you can see for these particular values that it's not so sparse and high load, uh, then actually as you go from the f is input layer, sorry, the input layer to the next layer, actually there is expansion of the noise in these parameters. So the performance gets worse. However, after one more layer, the system, the, 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 the dynamics go down, both correlations and noise converge to zero, which is a almost a perfect representation or invariant representation of the clusters. And in the, in here in this regime, when you start from zero correlation and high values of noise, you actually converge to a fixed point at one, both noise and correlations are the maximal confusing values. And in between, there is a regime of initial values where actually you converge to a line of intermediate fixed points which are shown here, these ends of those trajectories. So that's kind of a general structure. There is an enormous range of initial values that even though for a one stage is actually not enough to, to do the job, by iterating a few more steps, the network is actually converged to zero to very small values of noise and, and form rather remarkably well. Okay, let me now switch to uh, top-down question. Okay, so it's another work with uh, Elia Franklin and Jonathan Cadmon. It's related to uh, uh, other works in, in the literature um, addressing the problem of how, in, how to incorporate bottom-up propagation of sensory signals with top-down information. Top-down information can be attention, can be cues about the, 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 the task, or can be information, top-down information about from long-term memory or from other sources about the category or concept and so on and so forth. 
Okay, so here is the way we incorporate it into our framework. So we have these object representations as before, but now imagine that they are organized into categories. And we, we are not going to assume any physical feature similarity between members or tokens of the same category. We're going to assume that it's random labeling combining several objects into one category. That to simplify the, the, the analysis and to focus on the questions how to now in integrate information from category to help us process uh, the sensory signal, incoming sensory signal. So that's a very simple question. Imagine that I'm given information that the current signal is part, is a member of, of a particular category. So this seems that it should be easy to suppress all other possibilities and to remain with only the members of that category makes making the problem of processing this sensory information en enormously simple. So why this is challenging? And I believe this is a challenge that has not met enough attention from uh, our community. Well, the reason is that most, most models of gating and attention and contextual uh, uh, integration are doing, uh, dealing with low-level representations. So if you want to attend to a particular part of the visual field, what you will do, you will suppress neurons that represent, that have receptive fields in other parts. So basically, the suppression or the selective amplification works on the physical locations of, 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 the, of neurons, part of the neurons in the systems are suppressed and others are, uh, are, are enhanced. But the problem is when you talk about more complex uh, representations like objects and concepts, we're talking about distributed representation, where the same groups of, group of neurons are representing all objects, including the one that we want to suppress and the one that we want to select. So how do we amplify or suppress selectively, not in physical space, parts of the networks, but in state space. We want to suppress some of the states of the network or selectively amplify others. That stands out not to be simple. There is uh, recent work published in Nature by Bill Newsom and, and, and colleagues where they show a model of a recurrent network that performs such suppression or gating between two attractors, but that's still far cry from building a model that is computationally feasible that can do it in numbers that are interesting computationally. So we are going to, uh, uh, to propose, uh, again, within our feedforward deep network, the following model. Imagine that we have a noisy sensory signal coming into the system, but it's the, no the level of noise is such that by itself it won't be able to be recognized properly downstream. But now we have some cues about category and so on that invokes a category representation which then is going to be integrated in intermediate layer. And the key is that we have to now in our model uh, generate or create a, an intermediate layer or mixed representation where both the sensory inputs and the category inputs are in a nonlinear, highly nonlinear way are integrated into a mixed representation, actually in, in a quadratic or multiplicative representation. Then we can actually propagate this uh, further downstream. So we have our multipl multiplicative representation, mixed representation. From that, we create a clean or sparse representation of the input, and then we keep iter iterating this. Again, we put category input, creating a new uh, multiplicative representation, and again a new sensory representation, and so on. It turns out that it's, it's essential to actually integrate top-down information within our model into each stage of this deep network. It's not enough to do it neither at the beginning or at the end in order to be effective. And once we do it, the results are really remarkable. So this is an example of a readout error as a function of the layers at these stages that I described now, when you have, let's say, 900 part, uh, uh, objects organized into three categories, but in a regime where without information from top down, basically the readout will be a chance level. This is what, what you see here. And uh, as you see, by integrating top down in a nonlinear fashion at each stage of the cascade, 
we get essentially a zero error. So, so this is an example of how, in a nonlinear way, multiplicative and nonlinear uh, integration of top-down information can be integrated in, uh, in, in order to help assist in, in, in propagating sensor input. Now, of course, if you are Bayesian, this is a very simple task to do. You just set the prior to be on a one for the ca one category and, and zero for the others. But in a way, this is again going back to this localized representation where each object or each category are separated of different parts of the network. And in a way, this model that I suggest here is a model where quadratic or other nonlinearities are essentially doing Bayesian-like computation, but in a, a neural network distributed representation. Finally, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about an exciting new work with uh, our, one of our chairs, uh, Dan Lee, and, uh, and Suyun Chang, a student from Harvard, but perceptual manifolds. So, so far, I, I spoke about the variance and the physical features of, uh, of, uh, of objects as noise that has to be suppressed out by propagating uh, in, in, uh, in a deep network. Now, the question is, uh, perhaps there is an alternative uh, way to, to think about it. Perhaps we have to actually think about manifolds as the relevant entities for processing rather than points with noise. So, previously I discussed work where the object representation were Gaussian, nice round Gaussian uh, mixtures or, or clusters, but in, in fact, the way manifold, perceptual manifolds will come about will have in general more complicated geometry. They may have ellipsoid, they may have actually B lines, uh, closed strings or, 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 or uh, open lines, they may, may have uh, uh, rectangular shapes or rather uh, other complicated shapes. So imagine in our vision, current vision is that we have to stop thinking about processing or classifying points or vectors. That's what we usually think about. There are points in attractor space, in a recurrent network, or in a feedforward network. We classify points and, and we, we compute the number of points and the capacities and so on, and the VC dimension. Perhaps we should think about more relevant to, bi to biology and also to machine learning in many, in many ways is to think about not points, not vectors, but about manifolds. To think about classifying manifolds, the capacity, how many manifolds can be classified in a given architecture, what will be the VC dimension of them, what will be the structure of max margin solutions to a linear classification of this manifold, what will be the analog of support vectors, maybe support manifolds and kernel manifolds, how you learn and generalize in manifold space. How, how the, the, the capabilities of, of such a system that classifies manifolds depend on the dimensionality of the manifold, the size, the geometry, and so on. And finally, how do manifolds themselves propagate not simply noisy, noisy clouds, but geometric manifolds, how they propagate across deep architecture? What happened to the size? what happened to the dimensionality, what happened to the geometric shapes, and how these changes uh, improve their subsequent processing in downstream systems. So let me just give you a few examples of, of, uh, of thinking about manifolds and transforming or extending classical theory about linear classification or perceptron classification of points uh, to perceptron classifications of manifolds. So let's, let me remind you about linear classifications of points. So imagine you have points in n dimension, and some of them have to be classified as minus, others as, as, as plus, denoted by the colors, and uh, yeah, a, a perceptron has a vector of weights and has a, a decision hyperplane, so this is a linear classification of the points. And if you're looking at the max margin solution, then we will choose uh, a solution such that there will be these hyperplanes, a distance kappa, the margin, 
from the decision plane so that all points lie on one side of the margin, either above or below the margin. And we know a tremendous amount of uh, uh, information about the system from random, at least for the case of random labeling of points. There's a classical work of Elizabeth Gardner from the late 80s that developed the statistical mechanics of perception. And an example of the result is shown here where on the y-axis we have the capacity or the maximum number of points per dimension or per weight, p over n, alpha, uh, that can be classified as a function of the margin that you demand. Okay, so either the margin over the load or the load, the maximum load versus the margin. For kappa equal to zero, when you don't demand uh, a, a finite margin, the capacity is two, and that is well-known cover theorem. But as you see here, that uh, there is a well-defined theoretical prediction about how the capacity goes down if you, you, if you increase your margin and, and the simulations agree perfectly well with this classical theory. But the theory tells you more than just the capacity. It tells you the structure of the max margin solution. And you can actually compute how many points are going to be lie on the plane themselves, on the margin plane, as drawn here, and how many points are interior. So the points that lie on the margin, as, as you may know, are the support vectors or potentially the, the support vectors of the solution. They are the critical examples that define the, the solution. Where the interior points are points which if you, can move, if you move them around, nothing happens. And the theory tells you the fraction of the support vectors that, uh, as a function of the margin. Uh, again, a classical uh, paper by Abbott and Kepler from the late 80s. And as you can see here, the more, the higher the margin is, more and more points are going to be on the margin, which makes sense because you push the margin high, then it, you, you don't have enough room for examples to be in the interior space. Kappa equal to zero, when you don't demand a margin, there's a classical cover result, then basically you have half of the points are support vectors or potential support vectors if half of the points are at the interior. So this is kind of one of the ingredients of max margin uh, solutions or the theory of the perceptron. So now let's move to, uh, to, uh, to manifold. So the simplest manifold will be line segments. And ma imagine you have line segments, and for simplicity, imagine that you have, they have the same rate or the same length r, but they have random orientations and position in space. And you now randomly label them by plus and minus ones, okay, binary classification. So you again, you can, you can look for a decision hyperplane, and you can look for a max margin solution by distance kappa from the decision hyperplanes, and you can, generalizing the statistical mechanic theory of classification of points, you can actually compute the capacity as a function not only of the margin, but in this case of the radius. So if the, if the radius means the extent, the length of the line. So if the length is zero, you are back into point classification. If the length is infinite, you have infinite lines, so the weight vector has simply to be orthogonal to all the lines. There is no other way of, uh, of classifying them. And in between, you have a case, where interesting case, where the weight vector is not entirely uh, orthogonal to all the lines, uh, but only to a fraction of them. So what you see here in the right uh, diagram is again the configuration as a function of the length of, the, uh, of these uh, manifolds. And now you see that there are two types of support elements. The lines that only touch the, the, the margin, these are again support vectors because they have only points on the margin, but there are also lines or segments that are fully embedded uh, in the margin, and they are the support segments in this case. And as you can see here, the larger R is, the more support segments are being embedded into, into, the, into the margin plane, which actually makes sense because the larger the R is, the more orthogonalizing the weight vector has to be. So the theory 
is now capturing not only numbers of elements, but also their in geometry, in this case, their extent. Now you can look at more complicated structures like um, squares, two-dimensional squares, randomly oriented and positions, and you want to classify them by a linear, uh, by a linear classifier or by perceptual. And now you have a more complicated structure for the max margin solution. You have a fraction of points which are on the margin as a function of their, of their, of their size, but you have also a fraction of manifolds, squared, which are fully embedded on the manifolds, but you have also partially embedded manifolds where the sides of the squares are embedded in the manifold, but not the square themselves. Now, in both cases, in both cases, the lines and the squares, the problem actually is strongly related to points because the convex hull has these points, either the two endpoints of the lines or the four corners of the, of the squares. So you actually can ask, instead of classifying the full manifold, classifying only those two endpoints in the line case or four points in the, um, uh, in the uh, square case. Now, these, of course, are, are not necessarily the same calculation as the points case because the labeling now is that random, because the labeling is taking the entire points that define the, the, the manifold and give them the same label. But you can also look at cases where the convex hull of the manifold is smooth. So you cannot simply take two points or four points or finite number of points simply and turn it into, uh, into uh, a, a calculation of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the classifier. Nevertheless, the theory can be extended also to accommodate uh, 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 spheres in any D dimension which have a smooth uh, convex hull. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the right plot, it gives us useful information not only about the capacity limitation as a function of the, the size of those manifold, but also about their dimensionality. And actually, there's an interesting scaling that the size r, the radius of those manifold, have to scale like one over square root of the dimensionality of those manifolds in order for the, to have finite capacity. So let me then summarize what I've uh, uh, been discussing today. So first of all, the, uh, uh, the first part was an attempt to provide a, a framework where one can study systematically how sensory representations are changed in their statistical character when signals propagate from one layer to another, in particular when they are expanded into sparse representations. An interesting result, which is somewhat intriguing from the biology, uh, from, the, from, from, from the consequence to biology, is that random projections seem to be amplifying noise, especially in sparse representations, and don't seem to be uh, a, a useful uh, candidate for, uh, for such, a, for such a, an operation. On the other hand, simple-minded, unsupervised structure, like Hebian allocation and association, is that this guy as I described, uh, can do uh, a, a, a fa fantastic job in uh, suppressing noise and improve readout, in particular when you do it not in one stage, but you s s uh, iterate this into deep architectures. Then from a broad range of initial noisy conditions, the system actually converges to a fixed point of zero noise. So, what we have learned along the way is that even though the problem is still high dimensional, you can get insight and also quantitative predictions by focusing on the relevant, a few relevant statistical features. Like in our case, the size of the noise as it projected, uh, propagated along the network and the correlations between those clouds. So, for instance, in, the, in particular deep network that I, that, that I described, I showed you how the phenomenology of two-dimensional iterative maps can give us insight about what happens for given initial condition as the system propagates along the, uh, along the network. Now, this is a very simplified uh, framework where I made simplifying assumptions about the, about the statistical structure of the inputs 
and simplifying assumptions about how the network is created. Nevertheless, the hope is, and it so happened in the past, I believe this will also be in the future, that insight of this nature coming from theory of an simplified abstract models can be useful also to understand more realistic systems, both in the brain and also in machine learning applications. And surprising result was that expanding the architecture in the widths has a limited benefit. On the other hand, the, it, it's much more beneficial to stage them into a deep, uh, a deep architecture. Finally, I told you about two additional uh, variants. One is top-down information, how the challenge to f find good models that take top-down information and integrate them into, uh, into the deep network bottom-up information flow. And finally, that if we, if we take, hopefully, those elements and combine them with the last element that I talked about, which is not thinking about noisy points propagating along those networks, but thinking about manifolds of different geometry and different size and different dimensionality and how they are propagating along the network, eventually being read out by downstream systems as a framework, hopefully, for object recognition and object classification in neuronal networks. Thank you. So thank you, Haim. While you are clapping, there is an ad about opportunities for aspiring students and postdocs that want to join us in the journey of conquering the brain, understanding the computational brain, both at the Hebrew University at Harvard. There are opportunities. Please write to me. Yeah, um, Haim is delocalized, uh, having uh, two groups of, of students, one in Harvard and one in Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So that. It's, it's like a balancing act, uh, a balancing act where you have to have uh, two balls in the air at the same time. Quantum computing. Quantum computing, delocalized. Uh, so uh, we have time for just one or two questions. Uh, one in the back, Joshua. So I'd like to understand better the, the, for the deep architectures, slides that you presented, the shallow, infinitely wide uh, layer. How come uh, it's not having zero error even though there, it is possible to have zero error because you, you, you said you have as much data as you want, you have an infinite number of units, so this should be a consistent estimator, it should converge to the base error. What, what, what am I missing? Um, well, our understanding of that is that we have basically a finite dimensional inherent structure due to the correlations which don't disappear when you, when you increase the dimensionality. So that's kind of limit the, the effectiveness of uh, increasing the dimensionality. Namely, the, the, system, the, 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 the signals are not really in low dimensional uh, uh, manifold because of the nonlinearity, but nevertheless, they are still incorporating sufficiently strong, sufficiently strong correlations not to be, uh, not to be uh, amenable to, uh, to, uh, to uh, improving the performance uh, further, uh, further uh, uh, indefinitely. Actually, we have an estimate of the size of the saturation uh, 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 layer, uh, which is dependent on both inversely with the correlation and also with the, with the uh, with the sparseness. So the sparser the system is, the more you gain by going to a wider system. The lower the correlations are, the more you gain by going to a wider system. But for any finite correlations and sparsity level, you eventually hit the wall. So you mean the sparseness is going down as you increase the size of the layer? or this, the, the, the higher, higher sparsity means f small. So the more sparse the representation is, the more you can gain by expanding, but up to a limit. OK, uh, we have one last question. Uh, hi, thank, thank you again for the beautiful talk. The, uh, it looks like the capacity estimations for these, uh, for these uh, manifolds are based in some sort of distributional assumptions for, for whatever, for the distribution from which you generate these manifolds or points, something like this. Could you please elaborate which distributions you're using? and? Uh, whatever. 
yeah, uh, and if whether you think that these sort of whatever distributions you are using for theoretical analysis will be representative of of natural distributions over manifolds or points or something like this. Well, so, so the, the natural uh, application would be the following. Suppose you have uh, an IT cortex uh, in biology. Uh, a, a population of neurons that respond to objects or a phase area that respond to phases. Mm -hmm. You know the number of neurons, you know more or less the, the response properties. Uh, so you can uh, compute a population vector or points in the state, state, space, state space of the network that correspond to how the neurons as a population represent a single instantiation, instantiation of the object. Now suppose mm -hmm. you change the physical features of the object mm -hmm. in, in a continuous manner, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that although there is some degree of robustness in those, uh, in, in those uh, uh, represent, uh, representations, uh, neurons, even in IT cortex, are sensitive to those physical variations in orientation, in pose, in scale, mm -hmm. in lighting, and so on. So you can imagine in taking instead of points representing this particular object, a whole manifold of neural representations representing this object. This manifold is an invariant manifold in the sense that eventually perception or the cognitive system has to identify this manifold as the object. Okay, so you can imagine that now we take multiple objects each one of them will be represented by a manifold of neural states. And now the challenge is to compute how many of such objects can be represented by a particular part of IT cortex. Now the theory, properly extended, can be actually applied to get answers to these questions. Well, that will be uh, okay, thank you. A, a project for uh, next NIPS meeting, manifold learning in populations of neurons. Thank you, Hein. Can I so, ask my question? Well, well, maybe while you're switching computers. Is it a quick question? Is it a quick question? It has to be it's fast. very, very quick. I've been coming to NIPS for 28 years. I've only missed two. And I have to say, your talk today is one of the most profound lectures I have had the pleasure of listening to. I have a very simple question. When you look at the brain, on the one side we have perception. On the other side we have the executive. From an engineering perspective, I know they are the dual of each other. My question is, having described perceptual manifolds, how do you see the executive manifolds? How do I? Motor system. Uh, if, if, <clears throat> does your framework uh, also you know, apply to the output motor manifold? That's a great question. Where is Dan? OK. We are meeting at breakfast tomorrow morning. Motor manifold. It's a great question. I, 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 I'm not, this was a joke, but I think it's a great question because many of the theories about coding in relation to natural statistics are strictly applied to the perceptual sensory systems. And it's, I think it's a challenge how to apply similar ideas to the motor system. I think it's a great question. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.